What up, Mark Todd? Uh, recording this one in two parts. The first part we recorded on Friday. Uh, it's the uh, it's called Passion Apart. Uh, this came right after the news about the uh, uh, Jonathan Kaminga losing faith in the Golden State Warriors. Uh, we don't normally talk SWBA, um, but uh, felt you know felt like that one. So truthfully, I thought about deleting that one because it's it's pretty yeah. There's a lot of emotion in there, uh, but you know what? We're gonna leave it in. We're gonna leave it in. Let's just see behind the curtain. Um, and the second part, we're talking realignment. So, uh, yeah, we're back on a couple of broadcasts this week. Thanks for tuning in. All right, this is the more emotional part of the pod. Um, it's also going to be the earmuffs portion of the pod. So, slap them on because it might get profane. Kick it off. What the fuck are we doing in Golden State? Because it's clearly not figuring out any way to develop basketball players and a winning team. We're recording this just after the news that came out on The Athletic that, shocking, Jonathan Kaminga has lost trust in Steve Kerr, a guy who benched him for no apparent reason besides the fact that he was the third best player getting to the rack whenever he wanted against the Denver Nuggets for the final 18 minutes as the Golden State Warriors, yet again, blew a 15-point fourth quarter deficit as Nikola Jokic hits a 37-foot banker at the buzzer that sends the Warriors well out of the playoff race and now into the play-in race race at number 10. What the fuck are we doing, Steve Kerr? He has said, and we've said this before, and I'm going to apologize. This might be more of a therapeutic rant than it's going to be any intellectual value. But what are we doing when we have a player, Jonathan Kaminga, who has been absolutely dominant all season long, and he sits on the bench? And this is just a continuing trend of what Steve Kerr has been doing all season, even dating back to last year. Earlier this season, Moses Moody hits two threes in a row in a massive must-win game against the Sacramento Kings, win by 12, get into the play-in tournament. The reward, sit on the bench for inconsistent and aging, Clay Thompson to step in and help blow a 24-point lead. What do we do last night? Well, why didn't we put him back in? 18-point lead at the six-minute point in which Jonathan Kaminga would normally step back in. Kurz admit this in the post-game. So he says, why didn't we bring him back in? Well, because we were playing well and he was sitting for too long. It might be not the best idea to bring him back in. Really? The guy who was sitting for more than two quarters of a game against Portland steps in in the last 17 minutes, scores 11 points, and springboards a win that the Warriors really should have had in hand anyway after Kaminga was out of the rotation altogether. That's not a longer amount of time to be sitting on the bench. This is ineptitude and arrogance all blended into one in which the Warriors are coasting away and throwing away another incredible Steph Curry season. It makes absolutely no sense. What's going to happen? Well, what's probably going to happen is they're going to trade Jonathan Kaminga to either the Portland Trailblazers or the Toronto Raptors for some other bum out there like Pascal Siakam and Jeremy Grant. Neither of which are bums. But what's going to happen then? Kaminga is going to go average 20 points per game and be an elite wing defender, which he's done against the Boston Celtics just weeks ago, shutting down Jason Tatum on multiple instances in overtime and in the fourth quarter of a massive comeback win for Golden State as part of a five-game winning streak. Then return, the Warriors are probably going to get the seventh seed, lose twice in the play-in, and this whole thing is going to be for nothing, another wasted prime Steph Curry year. But wait, it's okay. Draymond Green's coming back in the next couple of games. That means there's even less minutes for Jonathan Kaminga and Moses Moody. Two players who, when given the opportunities, have absolutely excelled at every step of the way, minus their rookie season. And this is from a coach who said, you need to earn your time. That's why we put the veterans in. The veterans are that incredible, incredible five-man group of Steph, Clay, Draymond, Looney, and Wiggins is like minus 130 all season. But what does Steve Kerr keep going back to? That group. Last night, Dario Saric, you're closing five for much of it as Nikola Jokic buries him every single time down. His answer, put Kevon Looney back out there, the guy you benched for a rookie in Trace Jackson Davis, who, by the way, has been phenomenal when he's been out there, along with Brandon Pazimski. This is ineptitude, ignorance, and arrogance by the Golden State Warriors, more specifically Steve Kerr. Unfortunately, they can't do anything about it. If they were to fire Steve Kerr, Steph Curry's out the door, and Steph Curry is your only lifeline, your only pathway to relevancy now and into the immediate future, no matter how good I may or others may believe Jonathan Kaminga to be. This isn't going to end well. No championship team has sat in early January with a question mark of, does one of their key players that the coach maybe doesn't like, doesn't get along with said coach. That's not going to end in a championship. We've seen this type of drama play out time and time again, and it always ends up with a loss. That's what's going to happen in Golden State. This whole thing is going to come crumbling down because a coach who, when he was coaching Steph, 
Clay, Draymond, Andre Iguodala in their primes, plus Kevin Durant was considered one of, if not the best coach in the league. But what happened when all those players were gone in the 2019-20 to season? They won 15 games and they sucked. What happened when this team was back in the immediate aftermath? This team had no ability to be competent and they won 40 games ish and lost in the first round in the play-in at that time the first year of it the only time this team has been good is when under Steve Kerr's watch Steph Curry has been incredible and the role players have done the same but when he has had to actually coach and actually develop really good players he has not been able to do that and this is coming from a person that has been a Steve Kerr apologist from the beginning I'm out I've got nothing left to say for him. There's nothing left to defend. When you have a player that was absolutely unguardable by everything the Denver Nuggets were throwing at him and felt, because we're up by 18, we don't need to bring him back in. And when it all started crumbling down, he sat too long. It's over. The dynasty's over. It was over last season. But now, if this is how it goes out, it's going out with a disastrous whimper, and I can hope I'm wrong, it doesn't seem like I'm going to be. SimWorld U realignment. Um, look, I think that there's a real chance that from everything that Samuel Charles reported on and from what I've been told, I, I do think that uh, it'll be some, I don't want to call them seismic realignments, but I think substantial. And I think that's good for SimWorld U. I think it's good for opportunities for some of the schools. Look at Gonzaga and St. Mary's as a, as a prime example of teams that could be potentially could be potentially on the move. That's a better platform. The the, the current conference that Gonzaga and St. Mary's are in, West Coast Conference, it's not good, right? It's not good basketball, and and I think that's part of the reason why you could point the finger at Gonzaga not having a, a national championship at this point in their their recent impressive history because the testing is not there. They're also not a team that's going to traditionally be on mainstream media, right? And as a top recruit, that's certainly part of it, right? There's We, we see Caden Ship there. Certainly, Chet Holmgren went there. Jalen Suggs. Those are the Suggs and Holmgren are the most recent, you know, top recruits. But for the most part, a lot of the players that go to Gonzaga aren't going they aren't the top picks in the draft the way we see Kentucky, Duke, North Carolina continually now Alabama with DJ Childs uh, continually pulling really elite talent. I think that could change with the right conference. It's going to be dependent on where they go. I think the, the, the note there is not insignificant from Samuel Charles. If the Pac-12 might not be being disbanded as previously believed, and Gonzaga and St. Mary's are potentially, if not all likelihood, leaving the West Coast Conference. I think that's a breadcrumb. Now, where does that breadcrumb go? I don't know, but somebody of that type of information gathering of Samuel Charles doesn't casually drop something like that very often, right? That that two things appearing to be unrelated uh, in one tweet. Is that a foregone conclusion? No, because you're going to have... There's a lot of money on the line if the Pac-12 doesn't disband the way that it does, uh, or as it's projected to do. But a lot of that is due to football, right? A lot of that is due to the fact that you could afford to have Ohio State playing UCLA in football because that's a Saturday. It's Saturday night, so the students are leaving on Friday. And first, let's not pretend that academics are any more a part of the equation in college sports at the D- Division One Power 5 level. They're not. Academics clearly are not of concern. It's why the Pac-12 on the football field is drastically changing. But if there's any likelihood or any possibility, any sliver of hope that the the Pac-12 in basketball, in sim world view, does not fall apart, and truthfully, in any other sport that plays weeknight games, that's a good thing because right now it just makes no sense for a team like UCLA or USC or Oregon to travel to Rutgers on a Thursday to play basketball because that's a matchup that everybody's been clamoring for in basketball. It's not. It's not. And if the Pac-12 can stay together uh, to be able to survive the the realignment in similar view, that's a great thing. 
I'm not going to hold my breath because you got to convince a lot of people a lot of things to make that happen. But if, if similar, you could be the, the catalyst for that lack of change, I think that's a good thing. As far as wholesale, look, we're, I don't think we're going to see this remade, redone, geographically perfect college basketball landscape in sim world. I don't think that's going to happen, right? You're not going to have a, a nice cutout. You go on Reddit, you look it up, and it's very convenient that you've got all this, you know, the Southeast Conference, that's literally Alabama to Florida. Maybe you get South Carolina in there, right? And then the ACC is from North Carolina up to, you know, Massachusetts because that's actually the Atlantic coast and nobody outside of that region is, you know, one state removed from the coast. I don't think we're going to get that, right? I don't think that someone use walking in here uh, and announcing or leaking any type of information that says this is going to be uh, the, the similar you is going to be completely different tomorrow as we know it today. And when this news comes out, I'm, I'm not giving a date on, but I wouldn't hold my breath for that either, right? What I would expect to see is some schools that we might not have traditionally believed to be um, viable for bigger conferences be able to move up right if it's a Gonzaga moving up to a Pac-12 I think that's the the gist of our our changes I don't think we're going to stop Texas and 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 um, Oklahoma from going to the SEC I think that's still a very real possibility I don't think that we should be believing that this world that we know it or that we believe to future know it is going to cease to exist it's just going to be Impressive changes, but I think it'll be great opportunities because I think a lot of the schools that we would pre- previously believe at these these small conferences, right? Let's go to the, you know I'm a Vermont native, right? So let's go to the America East Conference. Vermont never was going to get an opportunity to bring in the UVM Catamounts to bring in good talent because first off it's Vermont, and second off they just don't play in in, in a viable conference enough. I think that's the open door for some of these mid majors to move up into bigger conferences, not saying Power 5, but just a better conference that gives them a better platform and a better opportunity to recruit good players that they previously wouldn't have the opportunity for. Because why would you go to, let's use the America East Conference, when you can go to a better conference like the American Conference? Big difference, right? American, like the best power, non-Power 5 conference. But if you can make that type of play, right? You could be in that conference, you're going to be in that conference. Why? Because you're getting better talent, you're getting better exposure, and you're going to be playing in more notable games with a better opportunity for you to become a better basketball player. So for whatever schools that make that mid-major to power five or or small, small mid-major to decently sized mid-major, I think it's a step up for Simrold U, it's a step up for the players, and it's a step up for the school because at the end of the day, the schools aren't doing this, right, unless they're making money, unless there's an avenue for them to be profitable on this. Unfortunately, college athletics has evolved to being a business. It's always been a business. We're not hiding that that's the primary motivation any longer. If it happens, when it happens, I think it's a good thing for the for, for college basketball, for Simrold U, and for everybody involved.